what I want to do in this video is to talk about Spanish colonialism as witnessed by Bartolome de las Casas. And uh, Bartolome de las Casas is somebody that uh, Peck mentions in Exterminate All the Brutes. Uh, he's sort of one of the key figures that he highlights. And so uh, this is going to be kind of a history outline like I've been doing of Spanish colonialism with sort of an emphasis on Las Casas and his perspective on things because, um, you know, what's interesting about about him is that he was there at the beginning and from the beginning he was against it, right? So um, that's that's pretty important. And this is a, he's a, he ultimately is a Dominican friar and uh, you know, is somewhat of a Latin American person. He was born in Spain, but but uh, as a young person, immigrated to uh, Hispaniola, and um, and so you know that perspective is interesting. And he ultimately does become a Dominican friar. And uh, Gutierrez, who we're reading later in this section of the course, he is also a Dominican friar. So there's that connection there. So, all right. Um, <clears throat> so let me, let me go through it. Uh, my wife and daughter are out for a moment. Uh, it's in the evening. And so, you know, they'll probably be back any time. So I'll just try to get as much uh, of this done as possible in this video. And then I'll, then I'll do uh, the rest later. All right, so Spanish colonialism as witnessed by Bartolome de las Casas. Okay, um, he does become kind of a uh, a moral, ethical, religious witness to the crimes of Spanish colonialism in the Americas. So let's see how that goes. So um, I want to start back in 1452. So in previous videos, you know, we got into the 16th century into the 1500s. And so I'm, you know, circling back and looking at, okay, Nicholas V, Pope Nicholas V, issues this papal bull called Dum Viversus. Uh, and in this, uh, Portugal is given by the authority of the church right, exclusive right to certain parts of Africa as colonies. And what's really significant here is that Portugal is given the right to enslave Muslims and pagans that they encounter, especially in Africa. So this is kind of a turning point in the enslavement of Africans, which then becomes a major part of the economy of the Americas, as hopefully we are all, all are aware of at this point. Um, okay, so that's 1452. And then uh, Christopher Columbus invades the Americas in 1492. So uh, about 40 years later. And uh, now I wanted to say something about, you know, our maybe it used to be very popular um, when I was a kid. I don't know how popular it is now for your experience. But when I was a kid, it was very popular for in, in, in especially in grade school to say that when when Columbus sailed from Spain out into the Atlantic Ocean, that there were many people who believed the world was flat and that he was going to, you know, uh, sail off the edge of the world. Uh, you know, that there's some point and that that's what people believed. That is false. That is not 
that's not a thing. I mean, maybe there were, I mean, there's people today that believe the world is flat, uh, allegedly. I, I mean, I question whether that's genuine belief, but, but for the intellectuals of Europe uh, at this time, nobody believed that the world was flat. Um, there was a very famous book by Ptolemy called the Almagest, which is like the, the most glorious work. Um, and it's most glorious because it's about astronomy or astrology. And I've talked about astrology in the past um, because those weren't clearly distinguished uh, in the days of Ptolemy or even in the day of Christopher Columbus. Uh, but this book was written in AD 150, 100 year, 150 years after Jesus. Okay, so uh, this is back in the Roman Empire uh, in Egypt. Ptolemy was an Egyptian uh, working in Alexandria, the, the, the hub of all intellectual uh, pursuits at, at that time. And uh, he had this book that was called the Almagest, and it was called the Almagest in particular by scholastics, uh, and, and these are the Aristotelian scholastics. Um, uh, uh, let's see. Um, so the, the Almagest is like uh, not the original name. The original name is Syntaxis Mathematica uh, or uh, Mathematica Syntaxis, which is to say uh, uh, teachings combined together, <laughs> the, the collected text on mathematics. And so uh, I think that that maybe is more the meaning is like the collected text on mathematics. And, and, and so uh, what Ptolemy did was to gather together the learning of the time that talked about, uh, and it is really about astronomy, uh, Kind of about astrology, but more about the the actual motions of the planets and the stars. Okay, and he gathered together as a kind of compendium of like the state of the art knowledge. Uh, it's he did not um, he did not check the data. All right. He didn't. He didn't try to look at the data and then give an analysis. He just kind of threw everything together. So it's a hodgepodge of things. And one thing that uh, he did in that is that he drastically under, uh, underestimated the circumference of the Earth dramatically. And now there was an accurate calculation of the circumference of the Earth done back in. 195 BC, like 200 years before Jesus. You know, so here we have what 300, uh, 350. So 350 years before Ptolemy, um, somebody had done the math and actually come up with a very accurate approximation of the circumference of the earth and that's Eratosthenes and uh, Eratosthenes is one of the greatest mathematicians of all time okay and he used trigonometry and um, you know used a very simplistic um, not that it was inaccurate it was, it was simple because he just he just understood the geometry of the situation, he used basic measurements that were available to everybody at the time and came up with a very accurate result, much 
larger than what Ptolemy had just like thrown into his book. Now the thing is that Christopher Columbus carried around a book, uh, you know, a copy of Ptolemy's Almagest, and <clears throat> and this is the basis on which Columbus uh, claimed to be able to to sail out, like you know. I don't know what it was, like 500 leagues or something like that, uh, you know, some 2,000 miles um, and reach the Indies. But that was obviously way off if anybody just checked the math. And, um, and so that, that's the thing that's audacious about Christopher Columbus. Not that people said, oh, the world's flat and you're going you're gonna to sail off the edge of the earth, is that you know, a lot of people did know about Eratosthenes' work, and they're like, the Indies are, you're way off, bro. Um, so, so uh, you know, the math was not right, but he was audacious enough to do it, and, and luckily enough, he found something in between. He found some landmass in between, which also, I mean, if you thought about it, it's like, well, uh, if the Indies aren't there, something should be there about there, you know, if the earth is not entirely just extraordinary in this part of the globe. So, you know, uh, maybe, maybe Christopher Columbus thought about that and maybe there's a lot of, you know, some propaganda aspect to this, but the story that we're often told is, is, is not correct. Okay. Um, because Eratosthenes, his work was never uh, was never totally unavailable, you know, in part because of the universities within the Islamic Caliphate. Okay. Um, so when he did set out, so he was, you know, Christopher Columbus was was made the admiral of the ocean seas like whatever's out there you're 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 in charge of it and um in his first voyage which took uh you know over a year 1492 to 1493 um when he did find some land he was named viceroy governor of the indies and he founded hispaniola which is modern day haiti and Dominican Republic, so that landmass, that island, uh, Hispaniola, um, and he sets this up as the seat of government in the Americas, and and then that continues throughout this story. So Hispaniola, that island of modern day uh, Dominican Republic and Haiti, is very important, and Santo Domingo is the capital city of Hispaniola at this time. And, uh, and so that's where the center of the Spanish colonies in the Americas is. That's the seat of government. Okay, so that's really important. Uh, maybe I should show you a map of that. So let's see. All right, so here is what it looks like, satellite imagery, but where is it in relationship to the United States? All right, so I don't, uh, I don't see it here. This isn't very helpful. Oh, I guess here, see this green part right here. So this is Cuba, that long island, and then at the like going off to the to the southeast is modern day Dominican Republic and Haiti, which Columbus called Hispaniola. Okay, um, maybe we could click on that. So, yeah, all right. So that that's Hispaniola. All right. Uh, so that, that's important for our story. Uh, Queen Isabella, uh, remember that uh, Queen Isabella and Ferdinand 
were married and combined the kingdoms of Castile and Aragon into the Spanish Empire, the, the Spanish Kingdom, uh, but would soon become the Spanish Empire. Um, she's concerned that uh, she's concerned about the welfare of the indigenous Americans. And so she, she sets out a decree early on, uh, immediately after Columbus returns to Spain, or, or maybe even why he, he's still away, I'm not sure on the timeline, but uh, she, she issues a decree that, um, that the Americas are uh, people living in the Americas as they discover them are subjects of the Spanish crown which means that they are not uh, of the status of foreigners. They are Spanish in some way. So they're given the legal status of uh, campesinos. So those are peasants or serfs. You know, we're still coming out of the feudal period. And so the notion of a serf is still uh, relevant. And so all the indigenous people in the Americans are considered serfs. They're the people that belong to the land. And, um, and, and then we'll see how that plays out. And so thinking of like my schematic introduction to Marx's political ecology, these people have the legal status of a serf within the feudal legal framework with uh, that concept, that legal structure of incomenida uh, that developed under Alfonso X of the Kingdom of Castile. Okay, so what that means is they cannot be enslaved, um, but then Encomienda applies, and that means that as the conquistadors, these uh, alterados, these advanced avant-garde lords, conquistadors, as we come to know them, as the conquistadors go out into this new territory, uh, they are able to apply encomienda and then these indigenous people who are considered serfs or peasants can be incorporated into a feudal structure where they owe tribute of some sort in terms of in, form, in the form of labor or in the form of money and the conquistadors can extract wealth uh, from these people, either in the form of labor or in the form of gold or pearls or whatever the case may be. And, and that is their right as conquistadors. Okay. But it is important to note here that we aren't talking about outright chattel slavery like the Portuguese were practicing with the conquest of Africans. Okay, and you can be the judge of why that is the case. Okay, so, uh, and let me, I noticed in previous videos that this is kind of small, so let's like try to get it a little bigger so it's a little more readable, but you have a copy of this uh, just so you can see where I'm at, okay, in, in the outline. But maybe it's a little more readable this way. All right. Um, so then Pope Alexander VI, again, of the House of Borgia, um, issues a papal bull called Inter Cathara in 1493. So this is the year that Columbus returns from his first voyage. And in this papal bull, 
the Pope confers the same rights to Spain in the American colonies that Portugal had in Africa, uh, stipulated in Dom Diversas. So 40 years later, the Pope says, okay, you get the same rights as Portugal had in Africa, we're gonna apply it to this region, and that includes the enslavement of Muslims and pagans, but Isabella, Queen Isabella, has already stipulated that the indigenous people of the Americas are not, obviously they're not Muslims, and so there's a key difference, okay. Because in Africa, even uh, pretty far south into Africa, Islam had spread like wildfire and most of the kingdoms in Africa uh, at this time and in the preceding centuries were Muslim. Uh, but in the Americas, okay, Islam is not a factor. Uh, but they are pagans. They could be considered pagans, but Isabella has already officially stipulated that they're not treated as pagans. They're treated as, as uh, uh, campesinos. Okay, as peasants of the uh, Spanish crown. But Spain does have African colonies at this time. So what this papal bull does is it confers the right on the Spanish crown to enslave Africans. Uh, and so Spanish enslavement of Africans uh, is at least official at this point. So, you know, and that's what we're tracking is like the legal documentation of things. All right, so I think my wife and daughter are here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop here and then um, I'll pick up with that in a further video.